to this Best Me in 45 Sleep Your Way to Better Health session this morning. Um, as I said, do stay on mute during the session just to prevent background noise, but there will be opportunities to ask questions through the chat or unmute yourself as we go along. We'll invite you to do so. So um, just for the purposes of the recording, I'm Michelle Saunders, Workplace Health Project Officer with the Kent and Meadow Healthy Workplaces Programme and my colleague Grace will be monitoring the chat function during the session. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping about us. So you um, may have been invited to the seminar through your workplace. So the Kent and Medway Healthy Workplace Programme is a KCC and Medway Commission Workplace Wellbeing Scheme. Um, your employer will be taking part in that, which is why you've um, had access to this session today. Um, so we do a number of these seminars, um, some of the best me in 30, some best me and 45 depending on their length the idea is that workplaces from across the county can just join in and get some well-being advice um, during the working day so we will be using the chat function during this session if you're not familiar with teams you'll see a little speech bubble it may be square it may be round just across the top bar if you click that it'll open a window and you can send us a message which grace will be looking at through the session um, do make yourselves comfortable drink tea and coffee um, we're all adults. If you need to take a break and nip away from the screen, just turn your camera off and pop away um, for a minute. Um, do make notes. We'll send out some resources and a copy of the slides and recording after the session today. And we will have a feedback survey at the end. So do please feel that in. It's really great to get your feedback on, on these sessions so that we can adapt them, make them as useful as possible, because we really do appreciate you giving up your time this morning. So just an overview of the objectives before we really get stuck in. So what we're going to be in this morning is we're going to have a look at what the sleep guidelines are, how much sleep do we need, discuss how sleep can impact our health and our performance, we'll share some top tips for getting a better night's sleep and signpost you some additional resources. Uh, just a slight disclaimer before we get delved into the sort of nitty gritty of the material. So Grace and I are public health practitioners, we're not sleep experts, we've done a number of bits of training on well-being, on different health topics, so we're just sharing some of that knowledge with you this morning from best practice and guidance. So if there's any questions that are outside our scope of our knowledge, we will we will be honest and say so and try and post you some resources where you can get further information or anything that we can't answer, we'll take away and we'll come back to you after speaking to our colleagues with a bit more expertise. So what is sleep? So we'll Sleep's actually got um, a cycle that we go through during the night. So there are some distinct states of sleep. You might have heard of the, the term REM sleep, which is rapid eye movement sleep and non-REM sleep. So there are three stages of the non-REM sleep, stages one, two and three. And we'll go through a cycle of sleep during the course of the night. So we start with this um, non-REM N1 session and stage and we'll, then we'll do a cycle round. Um, and each cycle during the night is 90 to 120 minutes per cycle and most people will have four to six cycles per night and why this is useful to know it's just useful to know um, what the different stages are for so the, the N1 stage is the lightest phase of sleep so that's when we're drifting off and that might be the stage of sleep if you fall asleep in front of the TV you can still hear a little bit of what's going on around you you might be easily awoken um, there's less known about the stage N2 which is about 45% of the cycle um, and stage three, N3 is the one that's is really interesting. That's that restorative phase of sleep. So that's when our bodies um, are repairing themselves. As a child, you'd be growing in that stage. As adults, our, our bones and our muscles are recovering and recuperating and healing if we've perhaps exercised or, or if we're unwell, that's when we'll be restoring our, ourselves. Um, and that's when if we do wake up during the night and we miss out on that stage N3 of sleep, that's when we can feel quite groggy if we haven't had enough of that. It's the deepest stage of sleep linked with restorative um, and sort of body healing and, and um and recovering from whatever we might have been doing during the day. Um, stage N2 is the most substantial phase of sleep, but it's the least that scientists currently know about. So there's more information on these stages on the Sleep Foundation website if you're interested. Um, but it's just useful to know that we have several cycles of this sleep cycle per night. And as we said, if you do get an interrupted night's sleep and you and wake up feeling groggy, it's often where you've not had enough of that restorative phase of sleep. Um, the REM sleep, that's the stage of sleep where most dreams occur. So you can occur have dreams during the other cycles. And it's in the REM stage that our emotional memories are also processed.
Right. Would anyone like to use a chat function to sort of suggest how many recommended hours of sleep we think we need as adults? What do we think? See a couple of guesses coming through. Mix between eight, nine, seven. The majority. Yeah. That's good. Thanks for your contributions, everyone. So let's bring up this little chart. So Royal Society of Public Health sleep resort here. Um, this gives um, sort of recommended hours of sleep for all age groups. So anyone that's a parent might have seen the sort of newborn and infant and toddlers graph um, in the past with, with small children. But as you can see, for adults, so I've just I've done a little highlight here. So it's between seven and nine hours and I'm sure we all know people um, that say oh I'm fine I can get by on five hours um, but they're not not necessarily the norm but they're often the sort of politicians or celebrities that talk about how, how they can function on such little sleep. I think Margaret Thatcher was a good example she used to regularly say she could get by on five or six hours of sleep but actually she didn't end up being very well in later life so it does make you wonder she functioned on it at the time but it probably didn't do any favours later on so recommendations are seven to nine hours of sleep um so it's obviously having to think about what's right for yourself as well so sleep is essential it repairs the body and helps consolidate our memories if we think of our brain as a bit like a computer so whilst we're asleep our brain will sort out those files from the day ditch the ones that aren't important and sort of store those memories and those things we need to do for later and this happens in our deep stages of deep sleep stages the quality and quantity of our sleep will vary as we age so as you can see on this chart as we get older we need less sleep so obviously children and babies are growing so they need more sleep for that growth to happen as we get older and growth slows down we need less sleep and as we get older again we just really need to um, have our bodies being restored and repaired and our memories and emotional memories sort of sorted while we sleep so we don't need quite as much as when we were younger and older adults over 65 often need a bit less again and um, sleep deprivation is defined as insufficient sleep or sleeplessness condition of not having enough sleep so that can be the chronic or acute and very widely in severity and um, sleep deprivation um, doctors will sort of want to look into it if it's been happening for more than three months so we're not talking about the odd night of bad sleep that is quite normal when we've got worries or things going on or we might have had a few late nights burning the candle at both ends so do you have a think about how you sleep in general? It's quite normal to have the odd bad night, but if it's persistently happening over and over for weeks at a time, um, getting into months, it's definitely worth seeking some medical advice. But how do we know if we're getting enough? Some pointers to ask yourself. So do you rely on your alarm clock to wake up? I think most of us probably do on a work day, but after waking up, could you easily fall back to sleep before 11 a.m.? And can you function well without caffeine before noon? So if you can't, if you could easily fall back to sleep before 11 a.m. and are not functioning well without caffeine, you're possibly either not getting enough sleep or you're not getting enough of that restorative sleep. We'll share some tips as we go through of how you can perhaps improve your sleep quality um, and therefore reap those benefits of sleeping better um, for your health and well-being. But anyone using the chat function want to suggest some signs of sleep deprivation so if we are a bit sleep deprived what things might we notice in ourselves or in others around us sometimes it's easier to notice these things in our partners or colleagues we're thinking oh they seem a bit grumpy today um what sort of things might might exhibit if we haven't slept very well Great suggestions coming through. Yeah, forgetfulness, irritability, yeah, being in a bad mood. That's a great one, being more hungry than normal. Um, does anyone notice that actually if I haven't slept very well, they may be sort of fancy different foods from normal, maybe one of more carbs, more high sugar foods as our body's trying to crave more energy to get through the day, not having rested very well. Unable to think straight, your short temper. If feeling very cold, just actually actually not sleeping very well can affect our body temperature, might make us feel depressed and low, your brain fog and lack of focus, yeah, being tired. So finding finding behaviours challenging, moving in slow motion, that's an interesting one. I think yeah, sometimes when we're sleep deprived, it can seem like the rest of the world's happening at a different pace to us. 
clumsy and moodiness, you know, poor motivation, you feel tired and lethargic, you really don't want to get up and doing things, perhaps being a bit quiet and withdrawn. These are really great suggestions, everyone. You know, eating more rubbishy foods, you know, that tendency to reach something high fat, high sugar, just to boost your energy, feeling more emotional. Another interesting one, sensory overload. So actually because our brains and our bodies aren't rested enough, we actually can't cope with taking on as much information. So here are some common signs of sleep deprivation. So yawning, that's what our body does that to draw in more air and more oxygen to wake ourselves up. We mentioned irritability, feeling fatigued or tired, depressed, moodiness, forgetfulness, having that difficulty concentrating, Many of us mentioned increased appetite or reaching for unhealthy snacks. Clumsiness, so we might be more accident prone if we're not sleeping very well. Um, reduced sex drive, lack of motivation we've mentioned, and increased sickness. Because actually when we sleep well and our bodies are rested and recuperated and restored, our immune system is boosted. So we're actually more likely to pick up colds and flus um, and bugs if we um, aren't sleeping very well and actually that then becomes a bit of a vicious cycle because if we're not very well we might not sleep very well um, and then that can continue or if we don't sleep very well we might pick up bugs more easily so the occasional night sleep where our sleep's disturbed um, won't harm your health you'll just be tired the next day and a bit grumpier such as having some of these common signs above but ongoing sleep deprivation can seriously damage our health both mentally and physically as I said, if we think of our body as a sort of computer and um, having that computer reboot, if we're not consistently getting enough sleep and enough good quality sleep in those deeper stages, then we are missing out on all of this recovery and rejuvenation to help us tackle each day. Um, also, obviously, being more accident prone due to tiredness and difficulty concentrating. And the some statistics will come on to about how much more likely you are to have a car accident if you haven't slept well. Um, a good night's sleep is vital and restorative time plays a significant role in healing and repairing not our, just our brains, but our heart, our blood vessels and giving our immune and cardiovascular systems a rest and a boost. So there's more information on the Sleep Charity website if you want to know more about the signs of sleep deprivation. Um, so these are sort of some of the short term things we might experience if we have the odd bad night or perhaps a bad week. Um, but sleep and our health is really closely linked. And here we've got some more sort of longer term signs so not sleeping very well um, can actually reduce our life expectancy so 13 percent higher risk of mortality for adults who sleep less than six hours a night um, lowered immune response as we've mentioned um, decreasing our cognitive functioning so our brains just can't cope with more information as we're tired and run down lower libido lower testosterone levels in men particularly with sleep apnea and that decrease in our reproductive hormones so difficulty conceiving perhaps and um, sleep really does affect our hormones and that's one of the things with our appetite as well the, the poor sleep will affect our hormones that control our appetite so we might not get enough hormones to tell us that we're full up our bodies will be craving more sugary foods as our hormones are disrupted um, weight gain. So studies show that people who have slept less than seven hours a day tend to gain more weight and have a higher risk of becoming obese than those who sleep better that's due to the reduced levels of leptin, which is that hormone that makes you feel full, and increased levels of ghrelin, which is the hunger stimulating hormone. So for our mental health, there's a higher risk of depression and anxiety associated with sleeping less than six hours a night. Um, single sleep is not going to make you a bit irritable and moody, but continually not sleeping well can lead to mood disorders like clinical depression and generalised anxiety. And then people with anxiety or depression were surveyed calculating their sleep habits. It turned out that most of them slept for less than six hours a night. Um, increased risk of diabetes if you sleep for less than five hours a night again to do with those hormones missing out on deep sleep um, may lead to type 2 diabetes changing the way that our body processes glucose which the body uses for energy um, increased risk of heart disease blood pressure goes up so you're not sleeping very well heart rate and other inflammatory markers and um, before you mentioned sort of life expectancy changing and that increased risk of developing dementia so sleep's not just good for our mental health it's good for our physical health as well and an increased risk of osteoporosis as our body in that deep sleep stage restores itself and heals our bones if our bones aren't being restored properly there's more likelihood of getting osteoporosis in later life so lots of um, links with mental and physical well-being um, this um, information comes from Professor Matthew Walker, a British neuroscientist who I mentioned at the beginning of the session and um, before we started recording. So he's got um, 
a really interesting book on sleep which is written just for sort of non-medical people to read I do recommend that if you want to know a bit more and um, it's a little bit eye-opening but without sort of moving to more go off the doom and gloom and why why sleep's um, so important and what it does to us to sort of thinking about how we can be a bit more positive in a minute but before we do that it's just worth mentioning that there are health conditions that can affect sleep Obviously, insomnia is, is a lack of sleep and that is a medical condition. Mood disorders will affect our sleep and there's a close um, link between mental health affecting our sleep and sleep affecting our mental health. We'll look a little bit more at the menopause in a minute. Um, other things that can affect our sleep, diabetes, muscular disorders and chronic pain. So if you are uncomfortable and in pain, that's going to affect our sleep. Um, cardiovascular disease, asthma, hyperthyroidism, heartburn or sometimes known as GERD, so um, gastroesophageal reflux. If you've got acid coming up um, in the night, that can wake you up um, and restless leg syndrome. But having the right treatments for these conditions can then manage your sleep better and help you to recuperate more. And there are also external factors that affect our sleep as well. So in a survey, we um, found that actually sharing a bed um, with our partner waking us up was one of the most common causes for a disturbed night's sleep and pets as well. A number of people allowing their cats to sleep either in the bedroom or on the end of the bed and then it disturbs you or perhaps a dog in the basket at the end of the bed um, can wake you. And then having that right environment in the bedroom, so making sure it's dark enough, cool enough, ideally sort of around 18 to 20 degrees. Um, with the right comfortableness of bed so everyone should be changing their mattress roughly every eight years and having our pillows um, clean and changed regularly as well it makes a big difference to how we sleep and that noise pollution obviously noises from outside can can wake us particularly in that first stage of sleep when we're more likely asleep but if you perhaps live near a train station or a busy road or a town you may get dis disruption from night so it's about making um sort of mitigations that you can manage so maybe having the window closed make sure you've got double glazing if you haven't um, maybe even using earplugs if you need to do something like that so insomnia is the world's most common sleep disorder affecting one in three people and that's characterized as having extreme difficulty in getting to sleep or staying asleep for long enough to feel refreshed the next morning if it's occurring regularly so at least three nights a week for more than three months or last for more than four weeks do talk to your gp and they can actually sort of try and assess what's causing that and get that looked at for you as i said sharing a bed accounts for about 50 percent of sleep disturbances and some people recommend things like having a larger duvet or having a single duvet each with different tog ratings if you're struggling if your partner perhaps prefers it warmer or cooler than yourself it's a little tip that can can help and snoring should be taken seriously if you have a snoring problem or your partner has a snoring problem don't just accept that as the norm um it is worth having that looked at and seeing if there's something that can be done about it So sleep in the menopause, so about 40% of women in their late 40s and early 50s experience sleep complaints as, um, as linked to the menopause and that compares with only about 12% of women in other age groups who would experience sleep complaints. So during that phase of life, um, the menopause can impact sleep more, partly due to changes in hormones. So again, sleep and hormones being very much linked. Oestrogen, as that starts to lower, that normally keeps our body temperature low at night and plays a part in our sleep and waking cycle. So as those levels start to fall, our bodies may struggle to lower their temperatures more and our body temperature does lower slightly as we go to sleep, helping us feel sleepy, which is why sometimes people find having a warm bath before bed um, help them to fall asleep because your body temperature rises in the bath and then naturally starts to fall as you dry and cool down which can induce that sleepy feeling and as progesterone levels lower that can affect our breathing drive which can contribute to sleep apnea or other sleep breathing disorders so there are things that can be managed we can look after ourselves better to, to sort of counteract some of these things and obviously the most other common sleep problems reported by women hot flushes and night sweats so you might wake up feeling very hot and sweaty in the night insomnia, sleep disorder, breathing and other mood and sleep disorders can also be more common in this phase of life. So again, it's worth keeping a note of what might be normal for you or your partner um, and then sort of speaking to your GP or health professional if it's really causing for concern. Um, people do recommend things like sort of taking vitamin supplements and, and light exercise to sort of regulate the hormones that we do have to help manage through this phase of life. So sleep and performance, as we said, one in three people in the UK are affected by insomnia. 
but 16 to 18 hours is a number of hours we're awake before our reaction time starts to drop to the legal drink driving limit. So actually, that's really just like a, a, a late night, isn't it? So actually, just bear in your mind, if you're going out for an evening and it's probably 18 hours since you've had a sleep, even if you haven't been drinking, that tiredness can affect your, your reaction times. Um, if you haven't slept very well one night and you need to drive the next day, perhaps think, is there another way you can, can get around? Can you use a train or the bus or get a lift or work from home? If you've had a particularly nice sleep, because it is um, quite quite disturbing to sort of think that actually you're four point three times more likely to be involved in a car accident if you've had less than five hours of sleep due to reaction times, not being alert, not being able to concentrate. And 200,000 working days are lost in the UK due to insufficient sleep. So as we've seen, it can impact our health. It also impacts our performance as well. And if we can do things to improve our sleep, obviously be benefiting our health and well-being and just performing that bit better also and keeping ourselves that bit safer. So we're going to move away from sort of the doom and gloom on how poor sleep is so bad for us, but have a think about what we can do to improve our sleep. So some top tips here, and I'll invite you to sort of share your own thoughts in a moment. So having a routine, very much as a baby and children, we sort of are encouraged as parents to get our children into a routine. Um, even as adults, our bodies are very routine driven. So sticking to that regular pattern that works for you, keep to regular sleeping hours, especially on working and non-working days. Um, I'll avoid sort of more than one to two hour lions at the weekend because that can then disrupt our sleep when we go back to work and um, having that routine will sort of tell our brains it's time for bed so if you always do the same thing of an evening and this might, might be why some of us fall asleep watching tv once we've done all the chores this evening and we sit down our body starts thinking oh actually it's going to be bedtime soon or if it gets as it starts to get dark that's another signal to our bodies and brains that it's going to be bedtime but having a healthy bedtime routine or you maybe do something relaxing and unwind properly. That's um, finding a pattern that works for you. So not everything will work for everybody. Some people will prefer to sort of listen to some quiet music or perhaps use aromatherapy or have um, scented candles on. As we mentioned, a warm bath that might help for some people. So just finding that bedtime routine that works for you and sticking to that regular pattern so that it triggers our brains and our brains recognise it's going to be time for bed soon and they start to slow down and get ready. Another thing that would really help with regular healthy sleep is to exercise regularly. So moderate exercise is one of the most non-effective, so most effective um, non-drug treatments for disturbed sleep. But they do say to avoid vigorous exercise in the three hours before bedtime. So if you do something vigorous in the three hours before bedtime, that will then increase your adrenaline, which might make it more difficult to get to sleep. So perhaps doing some light exercise, some yoga, some Pilates, some light stretching. Um, rather than perhaps going out on a long run um, can help us to sort of feel more tired, feel more relaxed and get ready for that sleep. Creating that better environment, so having a bedroom between sort of 18 to 24 degrees centigrade that's dark, that's quiet. Again, check the age of your mattress and pillows. A number of people obviously experience difficulty sleeping in that hot weather we had in the summer. That's because our bodies couldn't cool down enough and we perhaps got hot and sweaty and uncomfortable. So things we can do in our bedrooms and in our homes to make it cooler for sleep really helps. If you do have trouble getting off to sleep, do get up, lying there tossing and turning. It then interrupts those messages for the brain that actually our bed should be for sleeping. So if we're just laying there, um, it can sort of interrupt that pattern and then we get into the bad habit of not being able to get off regularly. So if you can't sleep very well, get up, do something relaxing outside of bed if you have trouble falling asleep. And then as you start to feel more tired again, go back to bed. And um, so avoiding screen times during that, so perhaps just going into another room with a dim light and reading or just sitting on the sofa in the dark, uh, do some breathing exercises or something. And in the same way of training our brain that bed is for sleeping avoid lay, maybe laying on the bed and reading a book during the day because that can then again interrupt those brain messages or might make you fall asleep during the day and then have more difficulty sleeping at night time um, another top tip would be to cut down on caffeine particularly in the evening so caffeine can take up to six hours to wear off and um, caffeine being a stimulant will keep you more alert um, during the day but also help you um, stop you from falling asleep as too much caffeine is consumed or too soon near to sleep caffeine actually has a half life of five to seven hours so if you drink a cup of coffee at sort of 8 p.m half of that will still be in your system at 2 a.m so if you have a couple of cups of coffee in the evening it's pretty much like having a cup of coffee in the middle of the night so cut down on caffeine in the evening um, 
each level of caffeine would be different for different people people metabolize it at slightly different rates but find what works for you for me personally i try not to have caffeine after about 4 p.m um, other people it might be 2 p.m some people can have it a bit later but perhaps switch to decaffeinated tea or coffee if you do like to have a warm drink in the evening Um, food and alcohol as well. So in addition to sort of having tea and coffee, too much food and alcohol close to bedtime can disturb sleep. Sort of heavy food in the stomach can, can make you uncomfortable for a start. Um, alcohol, whilst it will help you to um, drop off to sleep, it does restrict the amount of deep restorative sleep you get. And obviously, if you have a full bladder, it can wake you up in the night and alcohol can irritate the bladder also. Um, fatty and fried foods, spicy meals and acidic foods and carbonated drinks can take longer to digest. So again, that can disturb our sleep. Um, if you do need to eat before bed because you're perhaps too hungry to sleep, perhaps try something light like some crackers or a, light, a small bowl of cereal um, and hydration. If you find yourself waking up in the night, avoid drinking a couple of hours before bed. So try and hydrate yourselves more during the day or just maybe just have a few sips of water um, rather than a whole big glass. Um, I don't know if anyone in the call is a smoker, but nicotine is also another sleep disruptor. So smokers will take longer to fall asleep and wake up more fleek frequently. Um, the local stop smoking services in Kent and Medway will be happy to help you if you're interested in quitting smoking. Um, and there's a number of products available that you can have to, to help you do so. And reducing screen time. So we, lots of us spend lots of time on the screen, particularly on phones and tablets, and they will be emitting light from them um, unless you use a light filter, which is the same light that you get from the sunlight, really. So it's telling our brains it's still daytime. So do try to have one to two hours of screen free time before bed. If you do need to use a screen in that time, you most modern newer devices have a light filter so you can turn that on and it stops all that light being absorbed into your eyes and face um, and just re re reviewing um, relaxing content as well so not watching sort of too much high action um, really stimulating stuff maybe try and watch something more relaxing if you do need to use a screen a number of now devices will have like a bedtime mode so you can put that on and at a certain time it will automatically put your phone into like a dark mode to reduce that light and actually it makes it much less inviting to use if it's just gone into sort of grey screen and, and then also you're not getting those notifications that might disturb you in the evening and when you've gone to bed. Um, writing things down can be a really another good thing to do. So keep a sleep dry if you notice any patterns, but at the same time, writing down your worries or to-do list. If you're anything like me and you get into bed and then half past 11, you wake up thinking, oh my goodness, I didn't do this or I didn't do that. Jot down those things before you get into bed or have a notebook near the bed so you can jot it down, park that and then you can pick that up in the morning and you won't forget it and then but sort of back to that routine really allowing that time to wind down preparing ourselves for sleep having that bath listening to music stretching meditation whatever works for you as we said earlier our brains love routines and patterns so training it to associate certain tasks and habits with winding down for bed can be beneficial for sleep i'm just going to like pause for a minute so if anyone's got any top tips of things that they've um tried for their sleep routine that's really helped please do feel free to share that in the chat and we'll just pause and have a quick look see if there's any questions as we've been going along um Michelle, we do just have had a couple of questions. Um, one asking if they could have the name of the book in the chat, please. Yeah, um, I would get our pink pink put that in at the end. That's fine. At the end, and also, um, if decaffeinated tea and coffee is acceptable to drink in the evenings. Yeah, I would definitely um, say decaffeinated tea and coffee is more acceptable to drink in the evenings compared to caffeine. So obviously you haven't got that caffeine stimulant in your system for sort of five to seven hours. But just be mindful maybe of the amount you drink, because actually drinking a lot in the evening can still cause you to maybe need the toilet in the night, particularly as we get older. Um, some herbal teas actually have sort of sleep enhancing properties. So there are some out on the market which will sort of label themselves as bedtime tea. So just maybe try it out different things for yourself and see what works well. In terms of suggestions. A pillow spray, I've heard of those before. Visualizations to help. Some people have tried hypnosis or um, meditations. 
lavender oil. Yeah, lavender is one of those smells that's really associated with sleep. And you can get sprays and oils on your pillow or even a bag of lavender. Some people keep a bag of dried lavender in with their bed linen. So the bed linen smells a little bit of lavender when they put that on the bed. Reading a book that requires concentration, low light on Kindle, that's a good, good tip. Yeah, nighttime herbal teas, got lots of calming properties. Mindfulness practices, well, I've not heard of that one, a magnesium spray, I have to look into that a bit more, it's interesting. Reading, relaxing music. heard of this one thank you for this suggestion so um during someone had a period of insomnia in which they used a sleep mask from amazon that you could play music through they found that when they couldn't sleep listening to calming sounds really helped so again it's really about finding what works for you what you've got the budget for if you do have sort of um problems with light in your bedroom perhaps if you live on the main road you might have blackout curtains but some people find just a normal sleep mask you know, the sort of thing you may be wearing on an aeroplane can can be quite helpful again reducing screen time and um, try reading the book instead of being on their phones or I recommend another recommendation for a puck of peace tea yeah thank you for that suggestion so be careful when using lavender because people with epilepsy it can be a common trigger for seizures so obviously if if you do have other underlying health conditions, do speak to your health professional before trying out any sort of complementary therapies or, or essential oils and so on. And magnesium deficiency can play a role in sleeplessness and it can be absorbed through the skin. So actually, again, probably taking vitamins and mineral supplements that will also help. So having a good healthy diet um, rich in all the nutrients we need will help with sleep as well. Thank you for those suggestions, everyone. Really useful things to, to share. So thanks for your contributions. I don't know if we've got any shift workers in the room, but I'll touch on this briefly, because even if we haven't got shift workers a day, you may have a friend or family member or your partner that um, that does do shift work. So there's some tips for prepping for the night sit shift. So leading up to your night shift, do maintain a good core sleep routine. Try to bank some sleep and make sure that you're well rested in the 24 hours before your night shift. Sort of avoid having a late night before going into a night shift and perhaps exercising in the morning. And before dinner night shift can help you to sort of be a bit more tired and have a nap in the afternoon so that you're as well rested as possible and also ensuring that you're well fed and hydrated. And during the night shift, avoid the temptation of high fat and high sugar foods um, because that will um, upset your metabolism for the following day when you do need to then sleep again. Um, have um, During breaks, if you can, have a short nap. Um, use caffeine caref carefully and keep that in the earlier part of your night shift because, again, what we don't want is high levels of caffeine in our system as we then finish our night shift and go home and try to sleep. Maximise light exposure during the night shift. So if you can, actually, you've got lights on so it's making your body aware that it's still time to be awake and um, take walks if you get a break have a get out in the fresh air if you can try and keep yourself alert and then after your night shift have a light snack about 30 minutes before going to sleep so that you're not disrupted by being hungry but again avoiding those high fat high sugar foods that can cause sleep disruption resist using electronics perhaps keep your phone in a different room um, aim for a one to two hour nap the morning after the night shift um, and then try to re-establish normal patterns as quickly as you can obviously if you've got a night shift after a night shift that's a bit different but some people maybe do a night shift and then have a day off and then switch back to day so just managing that and all the while you're not on night shift try to sort of keep your normal patterns going as much as possible um, another thing that can affect our sleep I mentioned sort of the routine for children but any parents in the room will probably probably um, recognise that children can be um, a, a sleep disruptor. So although the session is focused on adults, children's patterns and disturbances can impact the rest of the family. So approximately 45% of adolescents get less than eight hours sleep each night. Some of that to do with screen time, to do with homework pressures. And as much as 86% of children with additional needs have sleep problems as well. So some of those most common sleep problems for children will be self-settling, changes in routine. So here it's half term this week. So children might be going to bed a bit later and getting up later. But um, try not to let those routines slip too much if it's possible so that when you come back to go back to school next week or the week after, it's easier to get them back into those regular patterns again. Um, children also might wake up feeling hungry and thirsty, discomfort either through illness or the environment, perhaps having bad dreams, night terrors or, or needing the toilet or nighttime wetting and sensory issues. There's a couple of really great resources here from 
um, the Sleep Foundation. So we'll share these again at the end in the Sleep Charity. So if you are a parent or a grandparent or have small people in your life, there's some really good um, tips there which can sort of help help the children to improve their sleep and then as a result support and benefit the rest of the family. The clocks do go back this weekend. I'm not sure if that means it's an extra hour in bed or an extra hour in the morning when the kids are up earlier. But we'll wait and see, won't we? It's always um, beneficial. So just as a wrap up, so sleep can impact both our physical and mental health, with most adults needing seven to nine hours of sleep each night. It's important to recognise the signs of sleep deprivation and do speak to your GP if you feel that poor sleep is impacting your health. It, it doesn't have to be the norm, it shouldn't be the norm and do seek help when you need to. And there are a range of health and wellbeing habits we can implement to improve our sleep. So a little bit of homework on action for you to consider one thing that you can do this week to try and improve your sleep. If you're happy to share, um, do, do put that into the comments. I'm um, just going to share a couple of resources on the screen, which we will send out after you. So we've got some general sleeps, a top tip resource, which you can have a look at. And just as a reminder of today's session. And then there are some more useful links um, online. So lots of sleep information available online by topic, um, shift work resources. If you are a smoker and that's impacting your sleep, obviously it impacts your health in lots of ways. Do seek help to, to quit if you're ready to do so. And then some general sleep resources. So there's a sleep assessment quiz on the NHS website, giving you a score and further tips. And then the sleep charity, you've got some great resources, both for children and adults. And then the NHS have some bedtime meditation or headspace meditation apps, which you might find useful. We'll send a copy of the slides out. These are all hyperlinked and then you can look those up in your own time. Um, I'm just going to go on to the last slide. So we do have our feedback survey. Grace will post the link in the chat. So please do fill that in before you leave. It's really useful to have your feedback. And if you wanted to come to any of our further webinars, we've got other webinars coming up. There's a link to book on to those as well. I'm going to stop the recording now. So if anyone wanted to ask any further questions, um, you can do so with those out, out those being sort of read out. But so thank you so much for coming this morning. Thank you for your contributions. Um, just before I do stop the recording for the purpose of the recording I'll just read out some more tips so avoiding drinking coffee six hours before bed and um, having lined curtains to keep the light out which is fantastic um, someone said they're going to stop drinking tea after dinner and um, someone said they're going to stick to a routine Breathe, breathing technique so that's a really good one as well having low, sort of calming our bodies down using breathing techniques so yes, again, thank you so much for all your contributions, taking more walks in the daylight. So I'll stop the recording now. And if anyone's got any questions, they would be more happy to ask while we're not recording. And um, now will be your chance to do so. But yeah, thanks again, everyone, for this morning.